Green Chol and Biju George and on behalf of the Southeast England and London branch of our institute, I would like to welcome you all to our today's event. Today we have with us Stanley George from London Offshore Consultants, who will be discussing with us on the topic Marine Incidents, a Technical and Financial Perspective. A few words about Stanley. Stanley has served as Chief Engineer at Sea with many years of seagoing experience. Also, Stanley has extensive experience as marine warranty surveyor and undertake numerous investigations and provide expert witness on claims relating to Holland machinery damages. Stanley has served more than 10 years with V-Ships Glasgow and thereafter with Brooks Bell and before taking up the current role with uh, LOC as a marine surveyor. Let's welcome Stanley to deliver the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Vinny, for the presentation and um, for the introduction. Uh, okay, then uh, the introduction part is over, so I can start uh, straight on with the, with, the, with the presentation. So it is a nice uh, place to be here on a Friday evening, which <laughs> I assume we will agree on a nice sunny day and the World Cup uh, going on. Okay. Uh, uh, today I will discuss about uh, the marine incidents from a technical and a financial perspective. That means uh, uh, when an incident happens, uh, what technically goes wrong, and uh, once we identify the faults or uh, the damages, uh, uh, what is the cost, the financial cost to repair and get things going. So that is the basic idea on, on this presentation. Okay, so th uh, this is the, uh, the contents. The contents are, uh, first, the first slide in this presentation I shall address the, uh, which starts some with statistics, so that once you know the statistics, uh, statistics uh, you'll have an idea on why uh, I have used uh, the engine failures, like the second point is engine failures, and uh, when you say main and auxiliary, I mean main engines and auxiliary engines. So after that, I will, um, uh, discuss on a common cause of these failures and then going forward I will discuss on the repair and cost related to those incidents. I've got few case studies to back up my discussion. If there are any burning questions in between you can fire away, otherwise we can wait till the end. Okay, here is the uh, statistics. I think you are able to see that. So uh, what, it, um, what it shows here, this study on the uh, horizontal axis is the year from 2011, in fact, to 2015. The reason I've taken uh, 2015 is because that was easily available at the moment. So the last statistics of 16 and 17 as well. But the trend is very similar. So uh, if you see on the top of the graph is a cargo ship, the one in the two. Um, purple type color. So 3,296 3, incidents were reported totally in 2015. Of that, the next point is 1,374, that forms 42% of the incidents were related to cargo ships. When I say cargo ships, it is a combination of bulk carrier, tankers, and all other type of ships, other than passenger ships, which is the next one. 868 incidents were related to passenger ship. So that means uh, it, it forms 27%. And the remaining 1,054 were from all different type of categories of the ship, which are many various. So uh, what I will, um, the main idea is to uh, discuss first on the statistics of the cargo ship and the passenger ship, which forms the main part of the incidents. <coughs> This is the uh, common types of ships that uh, that were in that are at that time the statistics were taken. The total number of ships uh, now this is a 21 percent, which is on the on your uh, right hand side, the first one that is cargo ships. Then the uh, the container ships is nine percent. You can see that one in the right hand. And the bulk carriers is 20. Oil and chemical tanker next is. 20% and 6% the last is passenger ship. 
So now there is a relevance why we saw well, the, the incidents on cargo ships were much more as compared to the passenger ship because there was a lot of cargo ships as compared to the passenger ship. So now, and now um, by ship type. So what I've done here is uh, the total number of incidents uh, uh, no, sorry, total number of cargo ships in the in the fleet were 39,773. So the incidents, which uh, shows is 1,374, were related to those 39,773. So that means it's only 3.4%. The uh, incidents to cargo ship were than 3.4% as compared to the passenger ship, which is 27.8%, because the fleets were very less. I mean, the number of passengers were compared to 3,117 passengers. So, uh, what, what I'm trying to show here is um, the number of incidents in passenger ships is relatively more than cargo ship. Although, when you see a very broad view, you'll find that you may think that the cargo ships are more risky or dangerous. So this is a brief um, uh, description of uh, the uh, incidents that happen on a ship by the location of the ship itself. So I have got this red, um, shiny, I mean, distinct uh, marks there. So the maximum incidents that happen on the ship by the ship location is in the group. So that is about 23%. 23% of the incidents uh, recorded were in the engine room. That is followed by oversight, and oversight is uh, uh, 13 percent, I think, 13 percent. So uh, when you say oversight, what it means is it's something related to the outside of the ship. So when you have a collision, you have a grounding or such similar instances, probably that could be due to a problem in the engine room. But uh, overall, uh, that is how this statistics is taken. And the other parts like the accommodation, this bridge, then there's cargo spaces, ballast tanks, bulbous bow for fashion. So uh, coming down, we can see that most of the incidents that happen is in the engine room. Okay. Now, the uh, why incident type? Now, uh, this is the statistics on what type of incidents. Now, this slide is very related to the previous slide. Uh, previous slide. We saw that the most of the incidents happen in the engine room, followed by oversight. So the, the orange bars that you're seeing is the incidents that has happened in the engine room. Now, in the engine room, there are two bars there. The one on the uh, right side is the, the main engine propulsion, I think. Main engine. Yeah, main engine. And the other one is technical problems. When you say technical problems, is anything which is technical but not related, but not directly main engine. So like it could be the pumps or motors or anything. Uh, the, why uh, I have two bars here? Because the incidents that happen to main engine is significantly higher, even when compared to the other technical problems that you see. And you can see on the right hand side, you have the other oversight, which mainly forms uh, grounding and collision. So there are many more. Uh, there are many more uh, small, uh, small things like fire, ground, uh, structural damage. Uh, that doesn't form very. Uh, there is also a payment type, payment issues, pollution. Pollution has also. You can see it's reduced quite a bit from previous statistics. I think. Now this is um, uh, the by cost. Now this analysis by cost. Now, missionary claims are the most common and, and represent 50% of all claims and 40% of the cost. Now, out of this missionary claims, missionary claims forms 50% of all claims. Out of that, damage to main engine forms 23% of the, of the claims and 40% missionary, and of the cost. So, within the missionary claims itself, uh, we saw in the previous slide, the claims uh, due to damage to main engine is very significant. 
Now, before I uh, say the next point, yeah. I, I have to say that this slide, the end statistics, is extracted from the Swedish club. So what it means is uh, they have a few uh, many ships uh, registered under them which are built in different places like China and Korea. Most of them for the statistics where the majority of the ships were from Chinese and Korean built ships. So their statistics is based on a comparison between China and Korea. So what they say is that the Chinese built ships form significant and higher part of the mainland claims as compared to the uh, Korean built ship. There were other um, shipbuilders as well, but they didn't form the major part of the uh, of their fleet. So that's why this uh, this point here. The last point uh, with four-stroke engines and the two-stroke. Uh, when I say four-stroke and two-stroke, two-stroke are the main engines normally for the for the main propulsion, and four-stroke are also main engines sometimes, but uh, it also form the auxiliary or generator engine. You could say the difference is they are well, they, they run at they operate at a higher speed than main engine, and um, the two it's 2.5 times more claims on four stroke engine as compared to the as compared to the main engine. Okay, so that was the all the statistics. Now uh, I got some case studies. I got three case studies. Uh, First one is uh, relating to a main engine failure. The second one uh, also relating to a main engine failure, but due to a turbocharger. And the third one is a generator engine failure. So ship A, ship B, and ship C. OK, the ship A, the main engine unit number five, sustained damage while in operation. The engine was shut down. And the ship type is General Cargo, built 1997, cross tonnage 2997. Engine is Deutsch engine. I put uh, Deutsch, I put Watsila because they don't manufacture it anymore. So the engines now are managed by Watsila. So by the, by the time this uh, incident was with us, we were in contact with Watsila. The case study involves damaged main engine, mainly starting with uh, cylinder unit number five and consequent damage to the crankshaft. Okay. This, uh, what you're seeing here is you can relate it to the uh, drawing on your left side. So it's the, uh, this is a piston, lower part of the piston, piston skirt we call it because it's a, it's a composite type of uh, piston. Uh, it has got a piston uh, skirt which is uh, aluminium alloy and then you have got a crown on top. So this is the uh, assembly. Uh, what you are seeing here is the upper face of piston skirt. So there is clear, it's very clear in the, in the, in the picture actually, there is clear evidence of severe contact damage. Actually, similar contact damage was also observed on the underside of the piston crown, which is <coughs> not, not, it's not in this image. Now, this is the connecting rod uh, of the same, of the same, and that's the piston you can see, which is on the other side. You, uh, you can see that dark black color um, discoloration, actually. That's due to overheating. This is the uh, bearing. You can see that uh, it is already uh, squished out actually because of the uh, load. And the bearing is, uh, is, is kind of, uh, what, uh, so this doesn't work actually. Uh, yeah, you can see it, it fits into the uh, into the connecting uh, rod actually, which is which is uh, behind that. You can imagine the pressure that would have come for the this to be come to this stage. Okay, so this uh, this is um, the black one, uh, the bolts that you see, these are the bolts that holds the piston skirt to the piston crown. In this case, there were uh, four bolts by design, which is supposed to hold it together. So this is a typical uh, case of necking, okay? the, the fracture caused due to overstressing. 
So the one in the black is the one which is broken. <coughs> Actually, there are two pieces. It just held together for taking the photograph. And the other one is not the new one, but the one which is not damaged. That that is how it should have been before. So what's happened was due to uh, due to the uh, extra load on the piston crown uh, and the and the skirt. Uh, uh, the stress, uh, the stress on this walls was so high that they parted. So when they parted, okay, when they parted, what happened was the uh, the, the crown got uh, separated from the skirt and the crown was stuck at the TDC position on top of it, and the skirt uh, kept reciprocating because the engine had not stopped, and the broken pieces of the snuts, bolts, everything were uh, stuck in between, literally making the shortening the length of the stroke. So when this happened, the pressure then came into the, uh, through the uh, connecting rod to the, to the crankshaft. So the crankshaft also was damaged. So, uh, yeah, that's it. Now, the cost of doing the repairs. <coughs> the total cost, for um, getting this thing back into operation was plus 800,000 euros and we spent six months. It's not very common to spend six months for for this job. You might, it's just like you change your crankshaft and the problem was uh, because this was a duet engine. Uh, the crankshaft uh, was not uh, readily available and there was uh, three months uh, waiting time for the crankshaft. So that's one of the reasons why it took six months. The tank set was replaced, and many other uh, parts were replaced. So uh, we did the root cause analysis uh, to find out the cause of failure. The cause of the failure was um, due to the tension above its ultimate stress, where the, uh, the studs that were holding the piston crown gave away. Why, why that happened? Actually, it's not supposed to happen. Why that happened is um, uh, they had a problem with the uh, governor of the engine. So to get the engine running, the crew decided to bypass the governor and start the engine. So at least two, maybe two or three times they started it and the engine went into overspeed trip by the mechanical uh, trip. And the, after that, I think the third time, that was it, and then it gave away. I think now they have replaced the governor as well. This is the second case. This is the damage to main engine, turbocharger, and, sub and subsequent main engine failure. So here, um, uh, the vessel was on a voyage from Russia, uh, from port in Russia to Finland. The damage to the, to the turbocharger caused uh, the main engine to fail and resulting in loss of propulsion. And basically the ship um, had to be towed to the nearby port. It's a container ship, 12, 2010, an engine MAN, eight cylinder engine. Okay. So what I'm seeing here is the underside of unit number three cylinder head. So these are the exhaust um, and the inlet walls. So uh, it's very clear, so they are damaged. The walls are damaged. And um, uh, the some of the broken parts, so in, in one case you can see there's only a hole there, it's supposed to be a wall seat, which, which was broken and then it found its way from a, to the exhaust uh, trunking and then to the turbocharger. And uh, there's a big uh, damage here. So this is the impeller of the turbocharger. You can see there is a, uh, the rubbing between the uh, rotary, I mean rotating and the stationary part. So the, the damage that you see here is due to the contact between, uh, maybe there are some foreign particles which has gone into it and it should be in very nice uh, alignment with the, the outer part is the stationary one and the inner is supposed to be rotating freely. So this is the turbine side.
uh, here also the uh, the blades are broken, so the the, the flying uh, I mean the broken particles disturbs each other rotate at very high speed. When these uh, particles come in contact uh, with the with this uh, turbine blades, it doesn't take uh, much time for this to happen. You are saying within one or two minutes uh, this is done, or even less. Also, when we inspected the scavenge as well as the exhaust manifold, we could find literally big chunks of metal pieces inside. Okay, now the repairs. The cost for this repair is uh, about 700,000 euros, took 13 days, so that's, that seems a bit reasonable. Uh, we carried out the repairs in, the, in Finland and turbine rotor bearings, which is, uh, there's many things were changed. This, uh, the, uh, the turbine casing itself was not changed because there was no damage to, uh, damage to the casing. But other than that, many other um, uh, cylinder head accessories were changed. Cause of the failure. Likely breakage of number three unit, inlet wall, causing broken parts to enter to the main engine turbocharger and subsequent failure of turbocharger and main engine. Now, why it failed? Uh, actually, one of the um, units which you saw that uh, failed and the parts of the exhaust wall piece were broken, it went into the turbocharger, the turbocharger failed and the ship itself was, uh, I mean, the main, and the engine itself was stopped, was stopped. So why the uh, main engine, now if you see number three cylinder unit during the time of damage had clocked 3,000 operating hours. That's interesting actually. The manufacturers um, recommend replacing this or overhauling at 30 to, between 30 to 40,000 hours. So it's a bit, there's a big range because it depends whether your engine is operating on heavy oil or fuel oil or so. That, that's why it's a big range there. But this is nowhere close to that. So it, it failed in 3,000 hours. So the answer is um, below there. It's use of uh, non-genuine parts. So when we had an inspection of the other spares that were on board, uh, we, we could not, in some of the spares, we could not see the actual original manufacturer's stamp on that. Plus, we could not even trace the orders for the parts that were in place when this happened. Excuse me, can you tell me what you mean by non-OEM parts? Because you can get um, original uh, parts from a trading house and use them and they still come from the supplier. So was yeah. it was it completely rogue parts? I think it was completely rogue parts because the two things that we were looking at is if there are any indications that it is from the OEM or if, as you said, if it is approved by the OEM provided by third party supplier. Mm. So in either case, we could see that in the, uh, in the orders for the program. Oh, thank you. Uh, <coughs> sorry, can I clarify, when at the time of damage it clocked 3,000 operating hours, how many hours did it have on in, in total? Was that 3,000 since its last overhaul or from... Oh, it is 3,000 since the last overhaul. It was from the last overhaul. Yeah, right. So the next overhaul was due at 30,000 hours. It, so the, it the, the genuine, non genuine parts are suspected fitted by the yeah. people on board. The, 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 there are a few reasons how uh, we uh, we came to the conclusion is uh, uh, we checked the maintenance record history, including like the new ball analysis and exhaust temperatures and various other and also the course of the maintenance history that they had. So it didn't seem they were negligent in the maintenance side of side of it. But when we looked at these parts, we could not really uh, track from where these parts have come in. That that's that's how much we can say. No. Did you identify any other uh, parts of the engine which had non-genuine parts? Yes. That, that's how we came to this. <coughs> the, the, the reason how we came to this was we initially identified some other non-genuine parts. That then we then tried to look into this part, and then we found a few other non-genuine parts which were there. I think that was your question, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. When would use of non-genuine parts not be a human erroneous action? Sorry, can you ask me? When would use of non-genuine parts not be a human erroneous action? I think it is in the, see, it's, it's a bit uh, mixed between that. When you say non-genuine parts, if somebody has used it, it is a human erroneous action. So. Okay, but you put it in the alternative, so I was wondering what the uh, options yeah. were there. 
Yeah, it is. Um, yeah. Actually, if you see at the end, everything will be a human error in its action. Not as much. When you just say non, uh, uh, human awareness action, so see if there is no human, there won't be incidents or accidents. <laughs> no, 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 no. This is an actual, um, uh, legitimate legal question. This is why I want to know. I have so an example of yeah. a non-genuine use part that is not attributable. To we also look into the uh, training uh, uh, certificates that they have that mm -hmm. the crew are competent enough to do the action. So, uh, in fact, when they got the certificate, they got the training, and they follow the checklist, mm -hmm. they got the uh, uh, maintenance carried out as per the OEM, mm -hmm. then we say that it should not be a non, uh, it, should, it should not be a human awareness action mm -hmm. because they have done due diligence for that. Thank part. you. That's the distinction I was after. Yeah. Thank you. So, I mean, I apologize if this is going to come on. Sorry, but sorry. My, my, my next question would be, what does the, the management system say and, and what was the management policy for purchasing spare parts? And, mm. you know, so which human approved the purchase of the spare parts? And was there an intervention by a senior manager or superintendent who actually made that decision to supply the wrong parts and left the crew in with no other option but to use them? So, but yes. I don't know how far the investigation goes. But, yeah, 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 exactly. That, that, that is the answer, actually. It, uh, we, um, it could be, I don't know. Uh, it, they have a planned maintenance system on board, and there, uh, I don't think any company will um, officially uh, will even agree to use a non-genuine non, uh, part, but it was there on board, so uh, we were, uh, our investigation was limited to that finding. So well, I'm sure, yeah. Now there should be a office uh, uh, review to see why this happened, so it will be, yeah. That is, that is another uh, uh, investigation in the, in the at the, uh, on Twitter, you know. Okay. So the third one, which is the last one of the case study, is the failure of a diesel generator engine. Again. There's a bulk carrier 2010 build. All these are not very old, you know, 10 build, you know, but, um, we don't expect which country? Have a failure. Huh? So you should put down the country of each case study. Country of build. Country of build, the ship build. Mm -hmm. uh, I have an SDX, so. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, the SDX built supply engines to everybody. Yeah. So I, there was one slide in first, you know, where you said the most uh, common related accidents uh, for the shipyard, how it is, so, you know, some of it. So uh, the, the next slide, which I'm show, uh, showing, is the incident occurred immediately after carrying out a repair. So that gives a very good thing now, what I'm going to talk about. So this incident happened immediately after a shore contractor came in to do a repair, and after the repairs is this. So uh, what you're seeing here on your right-hand side is the uh, engine Dismantled actually, uh, everything is open. There are no cylinder heads, uh, crankcase doors are open. And uh, what you're seeing on the right is the sump of the engine. So, this uh, connecting rod you can see the bottom half is lying there, and uh, some parts of the counterweight of the crankshaft is lying there. And it was a total disaster there. Okay, so I, I can read some statistics. Uh, uh, preliminary survey was carried out um, soon and found that engine um, uh, number one required <coughs> replacement. So actually what happened was in this case, the ship had uh, three generators. They had some uh, blackout issue sometime, somewhere, uh, sometime earlier, in, uh, sometime in early December. So when they had the blackout issue, they um, asked some approved, of course the contractor is approved by the OEM uh, to do some repairs on this. So the contractor came in and repaired number one and number two generator and uh, uh, they repaired, it, it was not a routine maintenance, so they had some problem already so that's why they came in to repair. And the repairs are complete actually within 15 days of the problem. 
This is the uh, crankcase door that you're seeing on the right, the aluminum crankcase door. The connecting rod, which you are seeing there, that uh, broke, broke in through the door, and that's the hole you can see there. And uh, the small piece there is the uh, flyweight of the uh, crankshaft. And on the right, you are seeing the piston, I'm sorry, on the liner, the liner you can see is broken inside. So that's a major, uh, uh, major disaster there. Again, you can see is the uh, you can see the condition of the bearing shell. It's completely damaged. On on the uh, on your uh, left, what you're seeing is the crankshaft. You can see serious falling marks on the crankshaft. I'm sorry, on the crankshaft. So that is where the cam uh, rolls actually. So. So what you uh, see is there's a crack there you can see that specifically around the number five unit uh, where the cross bolt connects the main bearing cap and it's decasing it. So um, it's very difficult to repair uh, when it forms the part of the frame. You can see a crack in way of the engine frame. So uh, once the uh, this uh, uh, connecting rod hit the crankcase door, so it was trying to it also damage the uh, engine frame itself. And uh, what I'm seeing here is the bro uh, broken part of the crank counter which has come out actually. There's uh, bolts, two bolts holding it. Uh, one of the bolts you can see that I mentioned, and that that's uh, gone out and it fell down. Crankshaft in this case was considered as uh, as beyond beyond repair. Now, in this case, there was a very high cost. It uh, went over a million, and it took more than four months. Mainly because the frame itself was damaged. Like uh, it is not something which could just change. In. So here. Um, all cylinder heads. There was a lot of replacement done in, uh, done in that uh, in this case. <coughs> now, what happened here is the since the engine failed immediately after the repairs. Uh, again, we, you can see this non-genuine part. We are not very sure, although the um, uh, manager said that um, uh, the contractor would approve. So that's what they need to take the word, but. Um, Obviously, the contract had a lot of uh, uh, had experience when we looked into it. But then, even if it fails, uh, it cannot just fail so early. Uh, what were class comments on these failures? <coughs> class involved at all? Yes, yeah. Class normally they don't give any um, uh, specific comment when something like this happens. What they say is they look at it, they give a condition of class, saying that you repair it. But if the manufacturers, or sorry, show contracts were approved, not approved? Uh, they, had, they had the papers, you know, showing that they were um, uh, competent enough to carry out the job and they had track records that they have done it. Uh, so, yeah, it's good. Uh, there is nothing saying that the repair has to be done the OEM. No, that, it is, obviously, it will be very expensive, so they will uh, get it done by some competent authority who is um, approved by. Uh, by the OEM to do this, so that's that, that's a normal factor. So it's not something what they've done was, uh, but the problem uh, what we found is uh, it should not normally fail as soon as a repair, and um, that was one of the uh, controversy which was there between the managers and the and the charters saying that uh, this um, has failed due to uh, uh, not due to any uh, problem with the uh, contractors, but then. Uh, no, if it fails, uh, if any uh, equipment fails due to over tightening or under tightening, it normally fails within the 10 to the power 7 cycles. That's that's the common statistics. So that means it has to fail within like as per uh, based on the running hours of this uh, of the generator. It has to fail within 15 days. 
of this fail after 18 months, I think, after the after the repairs. So there was a bit. Uh, sorry, uh, the, the other way, this failed uh, immediately after the repairs was done. So there was some uh, confusion in the um, uh, in the certificates, which they said that it was not. Uh, anyway, so. So uh, yeah, we have said the short contractors were not competent because uh, they, although they were approved to do the uh, to do the this type of job and they had a lot of experience, they were not actually approved by the OEM to do this uh, to the job, but their their experience. But again, that's not a requirement that you should. And again, in this uh, we cited some of the parts which they had used. Uh, this again, this happened in China, but. Yeah. Uh, we said, uh, we uh, cited some of the parts which had been used, and uh, again, they were not uh, the genuine parts. So, in this case, we did see genuine part as well. They had genuine part which had uh, the stamp and logo of the of the OEM. Yeah. Okay. Now, this is a general summary on on the uh, common causes of uh, the incidents. Overhaul not carried out as per manufacturer's instruction. So in, uh, in many cases we see that when you look at the running hours, they have not uh, carried out the overhaul as per the manufacturer's running hours. No experts, when I say no experts, that means um, uh, when you do an overhaul, if you don't have a expert um, contractor who are experienced to do the job, then you can get some of these um, accidents, you know, uh, immediately after the overall. Non-genuine parts, that is a, always a, an issue. True knowledge, experience insufficient. What it means is, uh, it's not that the crew doesn't have knowledge. Crew, nowadays, most of the crew, they are more into operating. So they, uh, they are, uh, have to concentrate on, on operations. If there is a, problem, uh, the, or a repairs or a maintenance, it's contracted to third party contractors who come and do the repairs. But the problem is if it happens while running, while at sea, then it's difficult to, for them to uh, get the correct repairs done. On, uh, also the maintenance part of it. Contaminated fuel and lubricating oil. This is a major cause of uh, most of the incidents, but I'm not um, in this example's case study, I have not included that. Contaminated fuel is a major cause because especially with the change in high sulfur, low sulfur, and viscosity changeover, so there has been a lot of issues. Also, this hybrid fuel, fuel sludging, and uh, lubricating oil. So lubricating oil, this is something uh, most of the uh, ships, they have the planned maintenance system as part of it. They do analyze the lubricating oil analysis too by some third party short, uh, short contractors. So it is very important that you do the lubricating oil an analysis and which not only tells you the condition of the oil that's in use, but also the condition of the equipment. <coughs> if there's any damage uh, to the equipment, like you can, you can identify from the lube oil analysis. Incorrect purifier operation. This is one of the major, many major causes that we have seen is uh, mainly this relates to the heavy oil purifier. Heavy oil purifier, when we use uh, the heavy oil, we, it is uh, supposed to be heated up to 120 degrees centigrade, which is normally maintained by a, a thermostat which uh, uh, regulates the temperature and keeps it steady without fluctuating. In many cases, we find that the auto controller does not work and there may be somebody who is manually trying to keep it to 120. So it doesn't normally uh, work like that. And this, uh, when the, anything below uh, 90 degrees you know, uh, on, the, on the purifier, um, it will not be purifying unless it will be just acting as a pump. The last point here in the common cause is bearing failures. Bearing failures are obviously the most expensive of all the other laws because uh, normally, bearing failure leads to very high consequential damage, like the crankshaft, and the crankshaft forms a major chunk of the cost. Root cause and extent of the damage. So now, what, what we have seen is when any incident like this happens, we have 
found out the common causes there on the top, uh, on the first paragraph. Now, to find uh, to find out the root cause of a incident is uh, very important for us and for many other entities as well. Mainly, if we know the root cause, we can then avoid such reoccurrences. Of course, also root cause can also be used to apportionate claim as well. Uh, thorough investigation uh, of the incidents to assess the, to assess the extent of the damage. This is something which is also very important, and uh, it's very uh, one of the things is very critical is once this incident happens, you don't have too much of time to do a detailed investigation and then find the extent of the damage. It is as soon as possible do the um, investigation, find what is the damage, and then the next part is you have to decide. What is the repair? Can the ship be repaired in this port? Is, is there a port nearby? So it is very critical that uh, you know the extent of the damage. Like there is a case where very recently there, prob there was a problem with the uh, rudder. So it was a uh, grounding, grounding issue. And uh, uh, when we uh, investigated, we found that the rudder was uh, bent. I mean, the stock was bent. <coughs> so now, uh, they had to urgently take to a nearby port. So the, rather, uh, the stock was, um, I mean, it's a, a dried off. We removed the stock, took, took it to the port, and then after three days, um, they conclude that, sorry, we don't have the facility here to uh, find how much uh, eccentric the, the uh, stock is because of the length and the diameter. And the, and the stock has to be, in this case, transferred to some other place. So. Extent of the damage will, if you are uh, able to know the extent of the damage, you can uh, minimize the cost and find the right place for repair. That, that's the, that ties up with the last point. So, decisions taken in an early stage are, are crucial for repair. So, if you have taken a wrong decision, that may, uh, and then you just increase your cost. That's it. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, the, the yeah. question? Uh, is there any correlation between if they use planned maintenance or preventative maintenance? Planned maintenance and preventive maintenance. When you say preventive, is um, like condition like monitoring, analysis, and condition monitoring. monitoring and see, um, uh, I I just tell you a strong, like short story. Is this, sorry, there's a reliability center of maintenance is a yeah, new thing yeah. coming in. I used to work for V-Ships for about 11 years, I was with v -ship, and I was the condition monitoring manager for V-Ships. My job was to implement condition monitoring to the V-Ships managed ships. So they had a thousand ships. So, um, and we could see a lot of incidents and accidents. So my whole uh, idea was to in introduce con uh, vibration analysis, acoustic emissions, level analysis online, monitoring for turbocharger, you know, everything. Imaging. Yeah, so this is all this could have been uh, fine. And we got acoustic emissions for the liners, you can do everything. But when we take this proposal to the owners to sell it, first thing they said, is it required by class or by anyone? No. <laughs> and then leave it. <laughs> so now, so because they got that strategy, I'm here now. <laughs> so there is a good relation, but it comes at a cost. Some people learn the hard way. But if you are if you if you are a if you are a ship owner, not the if you're a ship owner managing your ship, I've seen most of the ship owners manage their ship, they got a very good policy of using condition monitoring in line with plan maintenance. Not condition monitoring itself, but in line with plan plan maintenance. This uh, classification society also give you some uh, discount for uh, if you have a condition monitoring. Uh, yes. They give you some personal discount if you have a class uh, condition monitoring rotation. So the class doesn't have to come to inspect each and every thing. So it's been relating to these incidents, case studies. None of them had any condition monitoring other than the standard lubricating oil analysis. Would it have helped? Definitely. I my I is definitely yes. Any more questions? Any questions online? Is that? No. Thank you. 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 Thank you
Thanks, Stanley, Thank for the you. very informative and enlightening presentation. Thank you. And on behalf of the institute, we'd like to hand over the certificate to you. Okay. Please give a round of applause.